All right, everybody, welcome back. We have a lot to cover today. We're going to be diving into the stimulus package as it would apply to someone on the path to financial independence. A lot here. And uh, to help me with this, I have my co-host, Brad, here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, what's going on over there by you? Well, probably the biggest thing is I wanted to come back and close the loop from last Friday. I'm actually really surprised you let me get away with it. I said I have two segments planned, and I named one of them. And I said, and I was like, you know what? That's enough. We'll, we'll, we'll kick the other one back to this week. So here's the other segment. I'm going to close the loop today. And it is the silver lining segment, right? All right, so things are dark and dreary outside. Well, actually not physically. It's beautiful in Richmond, Virginia uh, for a weather perspective. But uh, everywhere else, it seems very dark and gloomy. A lot of bad news coming your way each way you turn. It's so easy to get sucked into that vortex. And I thought what we could try to do as a show and as a community is look for the silver lining each and every day. And so I don't know if we'll have a segment every day, but I thought that when applicable, if we have something good in our own personal lives or someone from the community has something that they share with us, either as a message or a voicemail, we should feature it on the show just to remember that we are going to get through this. So what do you, th- what do you think, Brad? Could you, uh, would you be, do you like the idea? Do you want to participate with me on this silver <laughs> lining journey? No, I'm not <laughs> looking for silver linings at all here. <laughs> Allow me no. my doom and gloom. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Jonathan. No. So first off, it's funny that, uh, yeah, I, that it like behind the scenes, the whole closing the loop thing, like I'm fanatical about that because when I listen to podcasts and the host is talking about something and then they don't come back to it. Mm. My mind essentially wants to explode. Like (laughs) I need you, I need you to close the loop. (laughs) So yeah, I let you go six days here with, uh, with unbated breath, but so, okay. Silver linings. While you were saying that I was jotting down three, but they're all, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very adept at, uh, (laughs) jotting these things down. So they're all related to connection. All right. So I've got, I've got three, like I said, uh, I texted an old friend that I had not talked to in a long time. All right. This is like my best friend from back home. Hadn't talked to him probably in at least a year. And I just shot him a text and just said, hello. We went back and forth and I, hopefully we're going to jump on the phone and catch up. I mean, everyone, I mean, you have captive audiences, right? Like people want to connect, just reach out to somebody that you haven't talked to in a while. It's so easy now. And, you know, kind of in line with that is everybody keeps hearing about these Zoom, Zoom calls, right? Like we had Zoom calls with Laura's family this past, a couple of days ago, we had an hour long Zoom call. One sister called in from London and her family, another from Long Island, her parents and us. And it was just, it was really wonderful. Like the whole family was in one place for an hour and it was really, really great. And then, uh, After that, we had a call with, with my family the next day and it was, you know, it was wonderful. It was just great to see everybody. And, uh, the third one I have here in connection was probably like just the sweetest thing. We just had our, the elementary school. So obviously the kids are distraught, like they're in, you know, they're four months out of school. They're not going to see their friends and, and teachers and such, you know, they're truly their family, right? Their school family. And the elementary school teachers just had essentially a parade. They, it was a 40 car parade throughout the entire set of neighborhoods that make up this elementary school. It was the most amazing thing. Like they were driving at, you know, like two miles per hour. Everybody was lining the streets, you know, on their respective properties. Obviously we're, you know, social distancing, of course, but, uh, every car that went by you're waving and cheering. The kids made signs and they colored with markers, you know, with crayons and such on the road. And it was just so amazing. It was just one of those things that were like, I was honestly almost like crying at multiple points. Like it was just such an emotional thing. And it was just human connection, right? Like even from 15 feet away, when you're waving to somebody that like means something to your kids and your family, like it was just really wonderful. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of teachers out there. If your school isn't doing that, man, I can tell you it, it meant a lot to all of us. And I know I could see it on their faces. It meant a lot to the teachers too. 
You know, what's amazing, uh, actually speaking of teachers. So recently we just spoke with Vincent Puglisi and we were talking about in the context of accidental homeschoolers, parents that due to the nature of what's going on in our world have increasingly had to take on a much more active role in their child's education. And, uh, there were a couple of people that were correcting us on the verbiage. there, saying what we should be talking about is distance education. And I think that actually kind of missed the mark. It's actually two different things. Parents that are now schooling their kids have truly become accidental homeschoolers. But on the other end of that, what we actually missed was that, and this is incredible, teachers with almost, with less than 24 hours notice have suddenly in mass how to figure out how to switch, flip everything on its head and take a system that has always been a physical system and figure out how to make it remote almost overnight. And they have at scale, when you look at this, done an incredible job. They are working around the clock. They are putting massive hours in. They are throwing all of their energy at supporting our kids in many cases. And th that level of selflessness, that level of just care and compassion that they're showing by doing this when clearly things are stressful in their own personal lives as well is a silver lining in my mind. And so I think what we, what I'd like to do is an episode on distance education, recognizing that teachers aren't just sitting on the sidelines in many cases, many schools are now asking them to figure this out and they're actually finding a way to actually teach our kids remotely. Like that's where this may be moving toward in many cases. What does that look like? How can a teacher advocate for this? How can they be on the front lines of this? What resources are available? What tips could be shared? We actually have, uh, Mandy, who helps us with the curriculum, has offered to come on the show and share what she's doing in her school system. And we're going to tee that up in a, in a very uh, near future episode. But I just wanted to point out that, yes, there are accidental homeschoolers. There are parents that are leaning to their kids, but there's also teachers all across the country that are leaning into serving the children that are in their charge. And what an opportunity for us to highlight what it is that they're doing and share best practices among them. So Brad, thank you for sharing the first of many silver linings. All right. Well, let's go ahead and switch gears here. So um, the stimulus package passed last week. I know we got a voicemail from Sean Mullaney, the Phi Tax guy, which we'll play in just a second. But Brad, I mean, this was a pretty unprecedented stimulus package like ever in the course of human history and in particular in the, in the United States. We've never seen anything quite like this, the speed at which it happened, the volume that it contained and the amount of people that it will affect. There's a lot here. Yeah, there is a lot here. And I'm very uh, glad, you know, you and I have both researched this, certainly. But yeah, to get Sean's perspective is going to be very helpful. And I mean, yeah, the the scale of this, I think roughly two trillion dollars and the speed with which it happened in a bipartisan fashion, which doesn't happen for virtually anything, unfortunately, that should clue you into the seriousness of this. Right. Like I look for indicators and like when I see something like that, when I see something that would not happen under anything but extraordinary times. It kind of says, okay, this is an aha moment. These truly are extraordinary times. No matter where you fall on the political spectrum, that's irrelevant. This is obviously important enough that they felt this needed to get done and needed to get done massively and quickly. So there are some real provisions in here that are going to help not only individuals, but small business owners as well. And I'm really excited to dive into it. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start by playing Sean's voicemail. Hi, Brad, Jonathan, Sean Mullaney calling in to discuss the new CARES Act. This is the act that provides economic stimulus and tax benefits and changes related to the coronavirus. Uh, several things going on here, rather complicated. Myself and others are still very much digesting the CARES Act. But I wanted to dial in and give the audience just a few high-level highlights. First of all, the rebate checks that will be coming out this year. You've probably heard about these $1,200 per qualifying adult, $500 per qualifying child. However, there are income uh, phase-outs. So many people will simply receive nothing or will receive a reduced amount. If you're below the initial Income limitations, they're published on the web, 75000 for single people, 150000 for married filing joint. If you're below those levels for both 2018 and 2019, nothing really to be done. You'll just get your $1,200 check, $2,400 check or more if you've got qualifying children. No need for any action or inaction. You may be well above the end of the phase-out ranges in both 2018 and 2019. 
in that case, no action to be taken. You're just not going to get one of these checks. But if you're in that meaty middle for both 2018 and or 2019, you may want to take some action or not take some action. General rule of thumb, and this is very general, if your income went up in 2019 over 2018, you may want to hold off on filing your 2019 return. So they base the rebate check on 2018. And the flip is true. If your income went down in 2019 vis-a-vis 2018, you might want to accelerate filing your 2019 tax return. Uh, there's plenty of stuff out on the internet on this. It's a little complicated, but I want to give everybody sort of the high level on that. Also, your kids. So for your qualifying children, your dependents 16 and under, they qualify for an up to $500 rebate per child. Again, the income limits apply to you guys, so you might not get it. But children and teenagers 17 through 23 are sort of in this unique Uh, situation with respect to these rebates, 17 and older do not qualify for this $500 tax rebate. And then the question is, well, couldn't they just get their own $1,200 rebate under their own name? And the answer is, if they are your dependent as defined by federal tax law, they cannot. So they're going to be in this area where they're not going to get any benefit, unfortunately, in most cases. Few other tax provisions. One, there's now a $300 above the line charitable contribution deduction if you do not itemize. So this is, hey, I want to give to a qualifying charity $300 a person. You get the deduction for adjusted gross income. So it's a little bit advantage, only 300 bucks. But if you're not itemizing, it's a nice benefit. It actually works really well for those who have already given to a donor advised fund in previous years and want to up their charitable contributions this year. A couple other things, 2020, all required minimum distributions have been waived. This is a really nice benefit. If you don't need your RMD in 2020, you don't have to take it. And it actually gives you perhaps a chance to do some Roth conversion planning or other tax planning But the big news is you don't have to take your required minimum distribution from your retirement accounts. That's really good. Another provision, you can take up to $100,000 in 2020 from a traditional retirement account or even a Roth retirement account. And as long as you qualify, and this is going to be where the rubber is going to hit the road, you might be able to get out of the 10% penalty. Um, This one is to be used as a life raft, not a planning tool. It's one definitely proceed with caution. But if you are experiencing some financial hardships right now and you're under age 59 and a half, this could be one after careful consideration and likely consulting with a professional. This could be one to take advantage of. Hope everyone is well. Hope everyone is staying healthy. All the best during this challenging time. Brad, I'm curious to get your thoughts on on a lot of the stuff that he just mentioned there. But that last one was really, really interesting in that the penalty, the 10% penalty. So, oh, my money's all locked up in a 401k and I'm going to, a penalty will be imposed if I draw it out. There's qualifiers there, but that can be waived by people affected by this. And affected means did you or someone in your family, your immediate family get a diagnosis of COVID-19 or were you, did you go into economic hardship, (laughs) right? I mean, like there's the qualifier there there's a lot of people that are slipping into those categories. It's been waived. And so not that I agree with Sean, that's a, it's a life raft. It's not a planning tool, but to know that now going forward, there is precedent because many people say, well, what if, what, what if I were to need that money and the economy were to, to crack just the fact that they were willing to go back and look at that penalty that quickly was really striking to me. And it's interesting to kind of put that as a footnote somewhere that, Oh, there's precedent for them waiving these penalties in times of extreme economic duress. I definitely noted that away, although I would never touch my 401k. Interesting to note. Yeah, it certainly is interesting to note. And and like Sean said, and I think this is the most important thing here is like, this is all developing, right? Experts are looking at this. This is a massive bill that was passed rather quickly. And we are still trying to parse this, you know, not that we are the experts by any means, but people are trying to parse this. And we certainly are committing to continually updating this as the information comes out. But yeah, like, and one little piece of nuance I wanted to add to that is, so the penalty 
is waived in in these certain circumstances. And and again, we'll have to dive into what exactly those entail. But that is still taxable income if it comes out. So this is not like a, hey, it's free money out of your 401k or traditional IRA. It's still a taxable event when you pull it out because it went in it went in tax deferred. So that's an important thing. Otherwise, you'd be seeing people, essentially every single person with a 401k or IRA would would do this if it was tax and penalty free, right? right. So that that's a really, really, really important thing to, to note. I did want to talk about the charitable contribution. So Sean talked a little bit about the interplay of itemized deductions and above the line. So, but above the line is, is kind of tax speak. That's not something that normal people have any idea what it means. So, uh, with the new higher limit on basically the standard deduction, right? So the standard deduction it's in the, what is it? 24,800 this year, somewhere. Okay. So essentially if all of the things that would have normally been your itemized deductions, your state taxes, your charitable contributions, things like that. If those are under that 24,800 for a married couple filing joint, then those are largely irrelevant. You just get, you get that standard deduction. So for most people, the vast majority of people, they are not going to hit that amount. And therefore it really doesn't matter if they make a thousand dollars of charitable contribution or 3000, right? They're still going to be under that amount. But what Sean is saying is in this cares act is it's $300 of charitable contributions. And my strong understanding from what I've read is that it's per person. Okay. So $300 per person made are above that line or above the standard deduction or the itemized. So that means regardless of where you fall, let's say you, you get the standard deduction, then you would also on top of that, because it's above that in the tax return. That's how, that's how people talk about this. Uh, you would get that $300 of charitable contributions per person. So I think that while this is not life-changing money, obviously even for a family of four, we're only talking 1200 bucks, it's still not nothing, right? And if you're going to be making charitable contributions and people need that money, charities need that money now more than ever, you know, it's not a terrible side effect that you can deduct some of that. So yeah, those are those are the things that jumped out to me. I want to. There's a couple more I want to circle back on. I'll go back to self employment in a second here, but uh, let's go back to the the 401k or the IRAs and talk about those penalty free uh, IRA withdrawals. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention: so the, the tax burden on that withdrawal, Brad, can it looks like it can be distributed over up to three years, 2020, 2021, and 2022. And if you want, you can actually repay that amount within the three years. And then you could actually file an amended tax return for a refund of those taxes paid. So again, a lot in motion there. But for those of you that are worried, oh, my 401k is too big, there's some incredible language in here that they're sifting out. So it's worth it's worth paying attention to. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, again, uh, this is not a planning tool, but there's a lot of stuff that they rolled out for these penalty-free withdrawals. And it's pretty incredible, actually, as you start to dive into it, especially for those of you that might have been thinking, oh, my 401k really is too big. <laughs> hey, Jonathan, I wanted to jump in real quick with one other thing that uh, before we move on, I think to the the small business side of this is where Sean was talking about the filing of the tax returns. This is actually a really important thing. So basically how this works is in terms of those those rebate checks, right? So it's going to be based on the most recent tax return that the IRS has received from you. Now, as we've discussed on the podcast, the 2019 tax returns are now due July 15th, okay? But there might be some play here as to how you file that return in order to potentially get this rebate check or not, like if your situation has changed dramatically. So like Sean said, if you're well under, let's say the, the 75K and 150K for married filing joint, if you're under that significantly, this is irrelevant. You're going to get these checks. Okay. If you're well over the phase outs, which I believe are 99,000 for single and 198,000 for married filing joint, if you're well over that, well, you know, good for you. You're not going to, you're not going to get this, this check, right? If there's some wiggle room or things have changed, you might want to consider when you file your 2019 return. So like he said, if your income has gone up dramatically for 2019, then you probably want to wait to file your tax return as close to July 15th as possible. 
because you would get this rebate check based on your 2018 return, yep. which was the most recently yep. filed one, right? Whereas obviously the, the opposite of that is the case. If your income has dropped dramatically and would get you under that threshold for 2019, file that sucker as quick as you possibly can. So yeah, there is some, some nuance there and clearly like, you know, these are the rules and we need to understand them. And obviously there are these link income limits and there are those phase outs. So it's just really important that we understand how this works. Is there going to be a true up, Brad? Like the person that's adjusting up or down and, and recognizes there's a way to get this uh, stimulus money, you know, now uh, if they, you know, decide which one of the returns they want it to be reflected on, like, is there going to be a true up next year? Or is it really just, hey, think about this very critically. This is the difference on, you know, $1,200 or $2,400. Yeah, I mean, okay, I, I am not an expert on this. This is happening way, way, way too quickly. My understanding as of right now is that it is based on your most recently filed tax return. So you are not doing anything bad in any way, shape or form of, you know, filing or not filing this. It's based on their most recently filed return though. I have to say, and maybe Jonathan, you might know some about this is there is something about the 2020 tax return, which I have yet to get clarification on. I think there might be, if your 2020 income drops dramatically, right? So let's say you didn't qualify based on 2018 and 2019. I think the true up can only be to your benefit based on your 2020 income. Yeah. But unfortunately you would not get this until you file that return in 2021. So now clearly if you've been impacted negatively in 2020 because of this and your income drops precipitously, but you don't get this stimulus check right now, you know, that's not ideal, but I guess then it'll just be the silver lining, <laughs> right? right. There's, there's your segment. There's, you, know, you can talk to people in, in a year and, uh, that'll be the silver lining. But yeah, I, I, I believe strongly that you would qualify to the good in that scenario based on your 2020 income. But I don't think at least by anything that I've read as of now, that there will be a clawback. If let's say you file, you got this based on your 2018 return, which was the most recently filed and your 2019 return shows a higher income. I've read nothing to convince me otherwise, but of course this is developing. So I, I will certainly keep everybody updated as I see new information. All right. So, uh, let's go ahead and move over. I want to talk about how it affects someone, a, a small business owner or self-employed. There's two aspects of this, Brad. I will save the PPP uh, paycheck protection program loan and or pandemic unemployment assistance. I will save that meaty title for you. I want to talk about the effect on deferred self-employment taxes. Uh, let's just basically what they are doing. My understanding is with this cares act, the employer portion for the remainder of 2020 can be deferred with 50% due on December 31st, 2021 and 50% due on December 31st, 2022. So that actually can massively affect your tax planning for this year. If you have a self person self-employed that has a business profit of $75,000, uh, I just was running a quick calculation on this. Your total self-employment tax would be roughly 10,500. And of that, half of that, 5298 in this case would be exact. That would be deductible. So your, your net earnings, that would bring it down to $69,701. So anyways, all that being said, people that are self-employed pay both sides of the self-employment tax. And it's worth noting that half of that can be delayed right now. And so um, nice little uh, silver lining. Uh, Brad, talk about the other half of this. Yeah, yeah, you bet. And, and it is important because for most people or for many people, let's say, these self-employment taxes are their largest portion of the taxes they pay the federal government. So this is not something to uh, just throw away and say, oh, it's no big deal. Like this is, this is a significant deal. So just being able to delay that, obviously that doesn't mean you're not going to have to pay it. So uh, delay does not mean no liability. I so, wish it had said waived. It definitely did not say waived. <laughs> yeah, it did not say waived. It did not say waived. But talking about uh, small business, and small business and potentially waived actually, which is kind of funny. So this PPP loan program, this paycheck protection program, this is the most developing of all the developing stories here. And, uh, I will tell you what I know as of right now. So the way that this seemingly works is that any small business in America, and I think that is defined as uh, businesses with 
under 500 employees as, as, as what I read so far. And if that business has been negatively impacted by this entire economic scenario, they are potentially eligible for this PPP loan program. Now, this is essentially to get money into these businesses' hands as quickly as possible so they don't have to lay off people en masse, basically. So the way that it works is you can actually borrow money. So it's written ostensibly as a loan, but it seems to be a completely forgivable loan, which in other terms is just a grant, okay, or free money, because many of these employees are going to be laid off. So this is the government saying like, we cannot have this. This is the best of a bad situation. But again, you can't just get this supposedly forgivable loan and then just pocket the money as the business owner. The way that it's forgivable is if you continue paying out payroll. Okay. That is the crucial part. And it seems to be, there's going to be a testing period of eight weeks. So basically how this, how it's calculated. And again, this is developing, but how it's calculated is there is a one year period prior where it's, it's from March 1st, 2019 through the end of February, February 29th, 2020. Okay. So you go back and look at all of your payroll costs. All right. And now this is where there's a little bit of uncertainty of what's included, but I think very conservatively, you can say at the minimum, it's all of your payroll. Now this is to W2 employees and crucially to 1099 contractors. Okay. Now the ambiguity comes in where what's included, are there health insurance benefits included, are 401k benefits and matching, are those included? We don't know that quite yet. And I think that is, that is developing, but regardless, the single most conservative way to look at this, just as a back of the envelope calculation is look at the wages or, you know, contractor payment that you paid out in that period from three, one, 2019 to two, 29, 2020. All right. So you get that total amount, you divide it by 12 to get your average monthly payroll. All right. And then you multiply that by two and a half. So basically two and a half months of payroll. And that is this loan that you can apply for. Hey everyone, I just wanted to make a quick insertion here. As Brad mentioned, this is all developing. And even as of Thursday night after this episode had released, the Treasury released some new guidelines indicating that contractors were not included in the original part of the bill that Brad was talking about. It looks like contractors are able to apply directly or able to get, in some instances, up to a 10K grant, $10,000 grant. All of, the, all of that is moving as well. So this is our understanding as the time that we released it. And if there are significant developments to follow, we'll, we'll definitely try to keep you updated as they roll out. This is moving and developing very, very quickly. We'll try to keep you updated. Now, as I understand it, this program, because this was just passed, that those loans are not open yet. I've heard that this is going to happen in early April. And we're not sure yet precisely which banks it's going to be through a bank. There's going to be a list of, of qualifying banks that you can go through. You do not, as I understand it, need to have any type of pre-existing relationship with that bank, but you do need to have a set of documents. You need to prove that you were in business. Let's say before, I think it's the end of February. You need to, you know, dot a couple I's, cross a couple of T's, but it is not onerous at all. All right. This again is them trying to stimulate the economy, lest millions of small business employees, you know, unfortunately will lose their jobs. So that's the backbone of this, but clearly they don't want fraud as well. So you need to be able to prove that you're in business. You need to be able to prove that you had this payroll. And then there will be this testing period that you have to basically just say, Hey, we spent this money on payroll. This is what it was for. We didn't line our pockets as business owners. So, I mean, this can be a massive amount of money, right? Like if your payroll is $20,000 a month in your small business, you could get two and a half times that you can get $50,000 in this loan that again is potentially fully forgivable. So a grant, if you use this as it's intended for payroll. So guys, I mean, I think of all these things for many of the small business owners out there, this is the single most massive one. So again, I, Gave a lot of information there. A lot of this is developing and we will certainly, certainly update you. But Jonathan, does that all make sense? Yeah, let's see. Is there, are there a couple of things I wanted to get across on that? So in particular, 
Like think about the the, the government, like 3.8 million people filed for unemployment this past week. That, those are the unemployment numbers. The government does not want to see that double and triple. There probably will be some variation of that. But in the short term, what they're saying is, can we just kick this can down the road a couple more months and see what shakes out? So every small business owner who's ha- gone immediately to zero or to 35% or 20% seen a massive contraction, don't let your people go. We will do whatever it takes for you to be able to make it the next couple months so you don't have to let your people go. And if you keep them beyond this, as we get through this, don't even worry about paying the money back. Well, well, you know, that, that's the, that is the premise for this. It's actually, I got to say, like, I don't, I can't imagine choose defy advocating for people that listen to the show, go take out a loan. If you're a small business owner, go apply for this loan. If you've been affected by this, go apply for this loan. If you haven't, okay, leave it for everybody else that has, but there's a lot of people hurting right now. And this is a great way to keep more of those people off unemployment. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep you up to date on what we find out as it gets rolled out. I'm sure there'll be more information, but Brad, wouldn't it be incredible if two and a half months is what we needed? Two and a half months is what the economy needed. Like, would that not be absolutely the, the biggest blessing ever? Yeah. And like you said, if this is a lifeline to get us through that, you know, then it's a wonderful program, right? I mean, just keeping people in their jobs, right? And we're going to come out of the other side of this at some point. And you know, hopefully we can all go back to businesses and an economy that is, that is still there and is still thriving. So yeah, I mean, this, uh, this certainly seems like a step significantly in the right direction. And, you know, I I think the one last thing is there also is going to be extended unemployment assistance and insurance. And I've also heard, and we will follow up on this, that for the first time ever that, uh, 1099 employees, that contractors will be eligible for unemployment. So, you know, people are hurting right now and people need this assistance. And it seems like these programs are stepping up. So yeah, again, for the, uh, I'm going to repeat it for the fifth time here, but you know, we are committed to finding out everything we can to help you, our community. And we will, as we learn more about this and we will constantly be learning more, we will keep you updated. All right, my friends, I hope that you got value from this. I mean, this honestly, a lot of what's going on, a lot of the news that you're hearing is, is about stuff that you can't control. And we want to stay informed, but you need to you need to let some of the noise just pass you by. This is really important. This affects you right now. So if you got value from today's episode, if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. Just lets the provider know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. We will see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.